needs no introduction. Um, Dr. Sharma is a world-renowned interventional cardiologist and the director of our cath lab. Uh, he is, a, uh, of course, a master clinician and a master interventionalist, but he's also a master educator. And uh, on behalf of the fellows, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sharma for uh, his devotion to fellows education in particular and uh, for his uh, support during a very difficult year. Uh, so thanks, Dr. Sharma. Okay. Okay, good morning for the new Monday. And uh, for this, uh, my favorite, the year around. So now we have shared the, right, so everybody good? Okay, hopefully uh, people can hear me. Uh, uh, yes, we can hear you. Any question, let us know. Okay, perfect. So as usual, uh, top 10 recent advances in quarterly intervention, they are like three, two months old. I didn't make it because then I still have to make for uh, to 2021. Uh, so this is, uh, I always start my presentation, tribute to Andrew Grunzik, because of whom we are here. He's the one who did a non-operative dilatation back in 1977. The first case of LADPCI, the balloon angioplasty, <coughs> while being in Grunzig, and then ultimately he moved uh, 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 moved to uh, Atlanta, I mean San Francisco, then Atlanta, uh, and he is considered as the father of angioplasty. Back then, his dream was the catheter-based percolative treatment of vascular disease in alert and awake patients. And then what I have added is with utmost safety. That is my quotation. So that is what we want to do. Uh, the data which I will present comes from various publications, abstract meetings, uh, and trials, and purpose there is that they have changed their clinical practice. So I'll go through 10 of them as usual. The first one is starting with the uh, Taylor PCR, Taylor of the genotype guided uh, antiplatelet therapy post PCI. The issue has been that there are some patients, the so particle is, is still the most commonly used antiplatelet therapy. It's not ticagrelor, it's not uh, brasagrum. It's 70% of patients is overall uh, PCI is still done with the clopidogrel. And there is an issue about uh, the poor metabolizer, which we say that resistant to clopidogrel, and that actually is called CYP2C19 allele uh, frequency. And this goes with the ethnic race, particularly Asians have very high incidence of this uh, allele carrier, and therefore, the metabolism which happens of the clopidogrel to the active metabolite is inhibited. So that's the concept. So question is what to do. So there are actually trials have shown that those who are uh, deficient with this allele, they have a higher event rate. We understood. So you are poor metabolizer, you have a higher event rate. But then can you modify? Can you do the genotype uh, testing which is available now because you can take the swab uh, and the results get into point uh, almost half to one hour as a point of care test, and you can decide that if you are carrier, that take presbyterol or ticagrelor, or, and if you are the usual care, if uh, regular work. So this was done in a small trial called ADAPT PCI genotype versus usual care, and there was no difference. And then, therefore, the, there was conflicting recommendation from FDA. And that is, there is a black box warning for the clopidogrel label that patients who are uh, a little positive, carriers of two, uh, loss of function allele, that those patients are alternative agents should be used. But still, there was no clear cut data that by using the new different agents, you are going to change the prognosis. And that started with a major trial called Taylor PCI. And this is a genotype guided oral, two P, P, uh, oral uh, P2Y12 inhibitor selection versus conventional clopidogrel therapy on ischemic outcome after PCI. So basically large number of patients, 5,300, and then of course they were tested, uh, randomized patients, uh, and uh, the basically those who were positive for the LL, they were, their antiplatelet therapy was changed, majority they became ticagrelor, or little bit of pressure group. Some continue clopidogrel because of some bleeding issues. Then in the same group, the, in, in the control group, they also have patients who were negative and they were on clopidogrel. So this made the, it's not a true randomization, but it was 
the in the control group those who are sensitive and they continue clopidogrel to see the benefit and see what happens <clears throat> with the dad am i a stroke and stent thrombosis it was non significantly lower in the genotype guided group it did happen mm -hmm. but at the same time look at the bleeding so whatever the trend was one negative one positive means more bleeding but yes it give rise to a lower uh, overall event rate but just is still uh, non significant unless you make it a in a large number of these patients uh, you have to have p value like less than 0.04 or 5 so authors concluded basically is that the patients among c CYP2C19, allo of carrier with ACS and stable CAD undergoing PCI, genotype guided selection of an oral P2Y12 inhibitor compared with conventional clopidogrel therapy without point of care genotyping resulted in no statistically significant difference in composite endpoints. And of course, there was slightly higher bleeding rate as we saw. And that was the conclusion. Basically, was that at this time, uh, conclusion from uh, Dr. David Moreterno that the clinical evidence at this critical moment. of revamping the healthcare system does not support the routine use of personalized genotype based selection of antiplatelet therapy for patients with coronary artery disease so basically in nutshell what it is that you decide in acute coronary syndrome that itself has come now in the earlier shown that uh, you need more aggressive antiplatelet therapy of prasaglandin ticagrelor against clopidogrel but now many trials have shown that both are equal but at least you make a decision on clinical ground and no need for genotyping so that basically the uh, assent of this uh, study is then second is define pci and forza imaging trial so basically lot of anatomical and uh, imaging studies were presented one of them was define pci and define pci was you have done a good yeah, successful yeah. pci <laughs> we need to mute this yeah so you have done the successful pci and you got it looks good now you do ffr or ifr to see is the lesion still physiologically significant or hemodynamically significant and successful pci because studies have shown that despite your good pci you still have a mate rate and angina uh, in about anywhere 10 to 20% of patients and also studies have shown that after successful pci some number of patients will still remain physiologically significant you do ffr ifr it still will remain less than 0.89 ifr and 0.8 ffr <laughs> So you have done PCI completed, and your graph looks perfect. But if you do FFR, there those are the positivity. The question comes, what to do? There are some studies you optimize. You do OCT. You make it a better. Maybe there is stent edge dissection, stent not fully expanded. So a lot of work has been done on this point. But at the same time, has been shown that if you are post PCI FFR, but less than 0.84 or more than 0.84, there is a dichotomy of the events. So yes. that post pci ffr predicts you want to bring it normal i mean you have uh, normal mean more than 0.8 but in some percent of cases you will still leave it about uh, 20% of cases uh, you leave it still uh, it remains high and now latest trial actually have shown also that even you want to optimize this ffr which is not part of the presentation today it shows that it's very difficult to optimize these abnormal ffr so whatever reason it is because it is diffuse disease or so and uh, with the trial showed that there was no difference uh, one difficult to do and with the post optimization did not make any difference so what the this uh, defined pci trial uh, study hypothesis was that residual ischemia as defined by ifr of less than 0.8 after operated a set angiographically successful pci residual lesion of 50% that what happens to them that how what percentage occurs So what they did, that baseline, all the patients more than 0.89 uh, guideline medical therapy don't do PCI, right? And all the patients, and then patients who have less than 0.89, standard care algorithm done, and they did their PCI, and then did the final IFR pullback. So, but that IFR was not told to the operators because we first needed to understand what it means, which patients do get. So it turns out to be that, as you can see here, that IFR, uh, PCI IFR was uh, 0.69, became 0.93. Uh, you know, but some patients, if you make a 0.89, many patients still remain less than, and that number was about 24%. So about uh, of the 467 patients, angiographically successful PCI IFR, 24% have a FFR IFR of less than 0.89. and it turns out to be majority of them 82% because of focal disease focal disease means 
at the edge dissection, or there is a which we say angiography looks 14% lead and distally, but it probably was, it was IFR positive. So maybe that should be taken care. So key is the residual ischemia largely because of focal and only 18% because of diffuse disease. We know that. You can take care of the diffuse disease. Besides doing the aggressive antiplatelet, anti-ischemic uh, therapy and lipid lowering, the diffuse disease you cannot take care. But focal, if you can identify, you can definitely take care of it. And that has led to this major trial, which is ongoing at present, for defined guided physiological stenting trial, GPS, 2,000 patients. And this will be the standard of care versus IFR guided therapy to see whether you make a difference in the overall clinical outcome. Remember, all these small trials do look very exciting. But once you make to the randomization, they really can the results be generalizable. So only one which has shown is FFR. We clearly have. Uh, but uh, but if we, even with the FFR, the number. And uh, so so here we need to see whether IFR versus standard of care make a difference. Now, there are other data also that angiography guided versus FFR guided actually saves lives. Uh, this is a and the data from uh, Europe showing that FFR guided PCI, although was done in a small number of patients, overall, if you can see here, about uh, 12, 15% of patients, the primary outcome, all cause mortality or instant resnosis and thrombosis occurs lower in the FFR guided group in the long term at 10, 12 years. Until now, we don't have data that FFR decreased mortality. This was a publication showing from the SCAR registry that long term outcome in terms of lowering mortality if FFR guided. But only problem remains, it's not randomized. It's selected case. So, but yes, uh, overall it seems to me that FFR also predicts good long-term outcome. So now question is why? Because I think it happens is identify vulnerable plaque, even less than 70%, reduce overall ischemia, and decrease stent use. So various factors which probably contribute FFR guidance to the good long-term outcome, including mortality first time from the SCAR registry. Then question came, now you have two tests, physiological and anatomical. So basically is the physiology, which is FFR, trumps over anatomy, which is OCD. Which one is better? So there is a trial called Folger trial, a small one month uh, the results and then one year, uh, one year uh, data recently presented. And what did they do? Patients with angiographically intermediate coronary stenosis, which they defined basically from 50 to 80%. To the PCI based on the FFR, less than 0.8, PCI, other medical therapy. Or you do OCT, and if you have area stenosis of more than 75%, or MLA, uh, taking 2.5 millimeter square, or the plus ulceration of more than less than 75%, all these combinations, they are the parameter of the OCT. So based on that, doesn't matter with the FFR, but based on the OCT criteria, do the PCI. So question was, in the intermediate lesion, we have a lot of data on the FFR and IFR. What about OCT? Should you guide your PCI based on the OCT parameters? And that was a part of the 4 trial. It was a one-month data, made no different angina status, little better uh, in, uh, in the FFR, uh, I mean, in the OCT group, as you can see, uh, Seattle angina questionnaire. And more importantly, that what we always have learned, that doing the FFR, it makes your procedure cheaper, financially better. Length of stay is lower, procedural cost is lower, overall cost is low. So basically from economical endpoints, the FFR is better than OCD. Now, there is a ticker on this, and that is a part of the next year, one year follow-up of this data. So a small number of patients, I mean again, not a large number, a small number of patients. So at one year, it seems to be that outcome, MACE outcome, these are the financial, economical outcome, your cat lab time, and so and so forth in China, that MACE outcome was slightly better in the OCT group compared to FFR. So that will be part of the next year. So another very important trial, which is ongoing at present, is the Illumin 4. And that is, in a complex patient, 3,500, high-risk clinical or lesion characteristics, patient with diabetes uh, and so, and lesion characteristics based on bifurcation, lesion length, uh, long lesions, more than one stent, uh, chronic total occlusion, and so, uh, and calcified. OCT guided PCI to optimization of your stent. They have still a very strict protocol or do angio guided PCI. Illumin 3, which I showed two years ago, did not make any difference in terms of the MLD, which was the main uh, endpoint of the trial. But Illumin 4 is the clinical trial. Endpoint is one year rate of target vessel failure, which is the death 
am I and see we are. So really we'll answer this question and our, uh, the, our fellow, Ali Zia, the, at Columbia is the PI, they are about uh, 1200, about halfway done through this trial, still take a long way, a uh, long time to complete and then have a more than one year follow-up. There is also a imaging study within, uh, embedded in this uh, trial and we'll learn a little more about it in the years to come. Then the TIMIS and TIMIS PCI trial of ticagrelor or in diabetic patients. So we know that patients with diabetes and stable coronary artery disease uh, without a history of prior MI or stroke also derive benefit from dual antipolated therapy with aspirin and ticagrelor is not known. Remember the dual antipolated therapy on these patients have been continued for a longer period of time whether you should give it or not and the Karishma trial was negative except the patients who have known CAD it was beneficial. So question always remains that patients who did not have a, a prior MI or stroke, is there a data that should you continue? So this was the instable disease with diabetes, a large number of patients uh, with the 20,000 patients, 10,000 in each arm, and basically randomized to whether continuation of ticagrelor or not, and basically showed the ticagrelor versus placebo in these 10,000 patients at three years, that there was definitely Primary endpoints were lower if you combine all of them, the death, MI, and stroke, but at the same time, bleeding is significantly higher. So one, you trade off one versus other. So the question then comes, and these are the various bleeding, including intracranial hemorrhage, 0.2% higher. And that actually was the biggest issue even with the pressable trials, remember, right on, uh, because of uh, intracranial bleed. Intracranial bleed is a bad, bad, uh, one of the bad, uh, uh, complication of uh, antipolated therapy, even if on, people don't pay attention or don't notice a small MI or so, but intercranial bleed will remember all in our head. Uh, so therefore, overall, the concluded that patients with stable coronary artery disease and diabetes without a history of MI or stroke, those who received ticagrelor plus aspirin had a lower incidence of ischemic cardiovascular events, but a higher incidence of mere major bleeding than those who received placebo. So question always comes, uh, is that do what do you do? So overall, it, I would say that my personal note on this will be that it does not make clear cut sense to start a ticagrelor for this purpose, uh, leaving aside some other indication. So then they said, let's take subgroup of these patients who have prior PCI. So this is in the thymus of the 20,000, and the, about 10,000 has a P, uh, in the PCI or no PCI group, uh, about 10,000, so half of them, got ticagrelor, other half did not. And what happened, if you see here, those who have history of PCI and history of no history of PCI. Now, in history of PCI, again, benefit is there, but now more significant. Remember that why p-value was 0 0.04. Now it's almost a 1.3% decrease in the primary endpoint of death, MI, and stroke. Uh, and in the no history of PCI, there was no benefit. So one thing we learned that Giving ticagrelor in this diabetic patient, if they did not have any history of PCI, does not make sense. Should we be doing in history of PCI? We had to go back to the bleeding issue. Now, bleeding again occurred about the same way. Remember, it was 2.2 versus 1. The year was 2 and 1.1, still high, but at least no intracranial hemorrhage. So, there, if, uh, and then, of course, in the no history of PCI, there is a tremendous bleeding, including the intracranial hemorrhage. So, one thing we learned diabetic, no PCI, if patients uh, with a no stroke or MI, those patients should not get ticagrelor. In the PCI group, you can balance the bleeding issue, and if the patient is not at risk for bleeding, you can make it a sense, and that basically puts it together in the net clinical benefit in the PCI group compared to no PCI group. Now, we also know that now we have the ticagrelor reversal agent uh, antibody is, uh, has been tested, and it works quite well various doses which has been looked that right away you can neutralize because we always have to see how can we neutralize the effect of any strong antiplatelet therapy, particularly when patients present for, as a severe bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage. So we will soon have the antidote to the ticagrelor. law. Next is Augustus trial of NOAC versus warfarin plus minus aspirin. So aspirin again came into the equation that one that whether NOAC is better compared to uh, antithrombotic therapy after acute coronary syndrome or PCI native fibrillation. We already have uh, three trials already, BOOST, Pioneer H5PS, uh, PCI, and redual PCI, uh, in, including various agents. 
and all have shown benefit of NOAC over vitamin K antagonists. The issue remains also that we are giving aspirin routinely to these patients. In all these trials, even if they're compared, they're still more bleeding. So maybe as aspirin, we, will, we should look into that aspect. So basically the trial hypothesis was two concepts. One, that apixaban is non inferior to vitamin K antagonist. And second uh, is the aspirin is inferior to placebo for major, you know, they have a special international society, thrombosis and hemostasis, uh, major or bleeding or uh, uh, clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So that was the concept. So here on the trial, 4,600 patients, half randomized to apixaban 5 BID. And look at this. Many of these patients, more than 80 years, which we tell all the time in the cath lab, some patient less than 80, 60 kilo, creatinine 1.5, should get 2.5 milligram BID. And vitamin K antagonist. And then 2 to 2 randomization in each group of the aspirin and no aspirin. So those are the two points we needed to answer. Whether apixaban better than BKA in AFib and PCI. And secondly, is aspirin needed in these patients? So let's go to the one point. So basically, vitamin K antagonist, apixaban. Bleeding, reduced significantly, as you can see here, 31%. Then, the aspirin versus placebo. There is a significant reduction of the bleeding, as you can see here, uh, or you can say that almost two times higher bleeding by giving aspirin to the entire cohort. So, one, now you combine both, and we need to see what are the four groups. So, look at this in terms of the bleeding only. Vitamin K antagonist aspirin, 18.7, highest bleeding. Epixaban plus aspirin, another second group. Third group, vitamin K antagonist plus placebo, and the best white epixaban alone with 7.3. And we mind these patients have PCI. So question comes is that clearly epixaban alone, and this is individual cases, actually some of them have uh, medical therapy also, medically managed. So whatever it was, in all way, epixaban came superior to the PCI, elective PCI, uh, ATS PCI, as well as the medical management. So single therapy. So aspirin, again, out. The, this will be the, our theme by the end uh, that aspirin may not be needed, which is a wonder drug. Uh, then safaristemi, trial of radial versus femoral PCI. We know that many trials have shown the benefit of uh, the mortality benefit of the radial axis in STEMI. Uh, compared to femoral access, as you can see here, uh, rival trial, then matrix trial, and this was led to uh, safari STEMI by Canadian investigators who are proficient in both femoral and radial. And basically, uh, the, you see uh, randomization to radio versus uh, femoral, patient presenting with uh, STEMI, and primary outcome was 30 day mortality, and shows identical radial 1.5 versus 1.3, although similar trials in the past have shown benefit. Now, these are the individual endpoints of the reinfarction stroke and the death is not significant. You always see this. Many trials, not all now, many trials have shown a little signal, non-significant uh, stroke rate. And whether it is, as we talk about in our uh, QAs also, that why we see slightly higher stroke rate with the radial versus femoral, but that has been a consistent observation in many, many trials and so. But overall, the primary endpoint and secondary endpoint of the trial were uh, not different. More important was lower vascular complication. And it turns out to be that, oh, sorry, take the stem thrombosis first. Again, no difference. Actually, numerically, somehow it favored the femoral, which I can't understand the mechanism of it. But this is where the trial results are. But the important point was the bleeding and vascular uh, complications. As you can see here, vast bleeding and uh, timmy major minor, all are non significant. You say, well, how that happened? Every trial before that has favored the radial. But now, all of a sudden, you are seeing no difference because most of the trials benefit of radial intervention in semi-patients were driven by lower bleeding. Because we know patients who bleed, we interrupt their antiplatelet therapy. They develop more events. They die many times. So semi, because of the event rate, is much higher. So in this trial, of uh, again, it's not a small trial, one of the largest trials uh, showing the safari STEMI. So if we put it together, the question then comes is that there was no difference, so how do you put it together? So I just said, these findings suggest that adequately trained operators should be able to achieve similar results using either radial or femoral axis or primary PCI. I can tell you it's a relief for many of our senior colleagues. <laughs> that is okay. 
that you're not uh, harming patients by doing the femoral PCI. That's all it is. So they, to me, I would say other way around it, not to the radial fanatic. The femoral fanatic that, you know, it's okay. Your practice is okay, you're doing femoral, that's okay. Now, if you put it together, <coughs> just because of the large, uh, you know, many trials have shown here, radial intervention, uh, positive uh, compared to femoral. So, but this becomes one of the largest trials. How will it come? The issue is still remains in the guidelines. In the Europe, the guidelines are plasma indication and acute coordinates in the STEMI using the radial intervention. It has not been updated in the United States. But after this trial, how we will come up, it needs to be seen. But this is just have to take as such uh, that despite having numerous positive trial, and this is for any field which you know uh, in our weather, for PCI, for any device, for Impala, some very good trials, some very positive, some negative. Okay, then we go to the next. Excel trial of PCI versus CAVIC for unprotected left main, five year results, which was presented by Greg Stone and published. Uh, uh, we know the whole trial of the Excel, 1900 patients, randomized to nine DES versus CAVIC, uh, and uh, the, at five years, death, MI, and stroke. Lilf in favor of cabbage, but non significant, and these are the odd ratio uh, 1.19. Uh, P-value of 0.13, so non-significant. So if you see really of that five-year curve, yeah. right? This is very interesting. Look at that. At one month, actually it favors the PCI. Because these we need to put into our uh, decision-making, knowing the patient's, uh, uh, what the lifespan is, what are the comorbid conditions are and so, and what is the uh, expected longevity. So now, if you take one, mo one month to one year, no difference. Very different is after one year, clearly in favor of cabbage. So clearly the long-term benefit is there uh, if you take the landmark analysis from each point. But in the short term, uh, PCI did quite well with something. Now you take the individual endpoint. These were the data at the three uh, three years, and I have just uh, put it just to overlap our three years with the five years. You need to concentrate on this uh, mortality, 8.2 versus 5.9. As you can see here, the it was not, did not make uh, over one at that time, maybe just a trend. Other points are clearly with the stroke was lower uh, with the PCI group, but non-significant. But clearly was the less extent thrombosis compared to graft occlusion in favor uh, and of uh, PCI. But of course, the overall in terms of uh, the revascularization favored cabbage. So this is a three year. Now I'm superimposing the five year. Now you see here, now five year p-value above one clearly become significant 13 versus 9.9. .9. So almost a 4%, uh, you know, 3.1% difference. And overall, uh, trend towards uh, the better outcome with the cabbage. These were the intermediate risk uh, syntax patients, so 33, 32 and below. Uh, and uh, overall, ischemia driven revascularization clearly favors cabbage. So key is, what does it all mean? So I, I think we just have to take it uh, in the sense that does PCI increased mortality uh, in this low or intermediate risk left main at follow-up. Well, this is the data there. There have been a lot of questions whether it's a cardiac death or it was non-cardiac death, so a lot of issues. But yes, what we need to say that overall endpoints were not different, and this we know uh, we still need to bring it to the our guidelines with the hard team discussions uh, uh, of course these cases will undergo, and uh, we still don't have in the United States uh, PCI at any class one while the low risk uh, as uh, low STS uh, syntax score and osteal is actually plus one in Europe. They're supposed to get upgraded or changed based on the Excel, but you remember that multiple controversies. So this field, I think, it still will remain. Uh, I don't think that this uh, Excel trial data will change the outcome uh, in, uh, in any way in terms of recommendation of unprotected left main revascularization. Since then, there have been a numerous papers uh, com comparing the, basically the meta-analysis of the cardiac death, MI, TBR, uh, PCI versus cabbage, and it seems to be that if you take all of them together, except the unplanned revascularization which favors cabbage, you have major points of the death MI and uh, uh, cardiovascular death MI and stroke were no different if you take all the randomized trials of PCI versus cabbage in unprotected left main. Now, BK crash in terms of what technique you should use, so we have the the longest data, we have one-year data earlier. Now the three-year data of the DK crush is special technique that uh, provisional stenting versus the DK crush stenting uh, was uh, DK crush 
two stand up votes were superior but they still left men bifurcation there are two other piece of information came about the left men intervention one is the volume dependence and volume dependence we are talking about doing about 10 cases or 30 cases or more than 30 cases per year and you can see that uh, from from china that clearly there is a big gradient almost double 4.1 percent mortality in a low volume operator versus high volume operator of two so seems to be that le unprotected left main should be done by experienced interventionist second is incorporation of imaging intravascular imaging whether iwas or ff uh, oct and this actually also has shown this is from europe uh, from uh, british cardiovascular society that uh, imaging really decrease the overall mortality after left main pci again there in a small percent of cases but uh, or it seems to be that whenever you use imaging it really improve your overall outcome so whether it will become class 1 indication is updated guidelines it still need to be seen it is still remain class 2b uh, indication at present that imaging be done with a complex cases and left main disease then complete trial of the stemi pci strategy remember the there have been a three trials of trami culprit and primluti in various types of uh, whether you do pci same time or during the same admission or after pci overall has taken this field that complete revascularization is better compared to a culprit revascularization and that was uh, that led to uh, in the past remember it used to be class 3 then became a recommendation that uh, PCI of the non-culprit vessel also at the same time becomes a uh, type 2B, uh, and so and then with this last trial of complete revascularization with multi-vessel uh, disease uh, in whether you do culprit PCI or uh, you do multi-vessel PCI. And second point was if you do multi-vessel PCI, when do you do it? Same hospital admission, same time, or you do it few weeks later? Stage intervention. So this is a. the trial you know all these are large number uh, large patient trials uh, uh, done from uh, canada uh, to 4000 patients and they basically uh, kind of uh, usual our stemi patient characteristics uh, many of them just present with the uh, you know additional one of the vessel disease and they have a after pci was done in the reverse position group complete revascularization syntax score was zero so means uh, those did a good job and you revascularize completely so what did we find So as you can see here, at follow-up median of three, that there was one percent decrease in mortality. That or MI, mortality or MI in patients who got complete revascularization versus culprit revascularization. Red bar is culprit, complete is blue, and individual endpoints are here. Cardiovascular death, MI, and uh, revascularization really makes a big difference, and individual endpoints here. So clearly, it supports the complete revascularization. The second question was, when do you do it? during initial hospitalization they did within like uh, not at the same time but next day or so about 1 and 1/2 23 24 hours later or you do stage intervention that was done about 3 weeks later 21 days so what did we find that am i so basically you see the bar the blue bar whether you do initial or after say and same thing that if you are and the overall it seems to be the difference remains so whether you want to do it same time so our practice has been unless it's a very A highly but significant ulcerated lesion. We try to stage it. So whether you do it a four month, a four weeks or so, although the trial it was done within one month, so about 21, 22 days, uh, and uh, so seems to be the complete re revascularization is beneficial. So now, two A is our so far STEMI guideline. Whether in the updated guideline will become class one, we need to see. At the same time, this whole concept is being looked at in the cardiology shop. Look at the how things have changed in the last 20 years. Remember, 20 years ago we were taught cardiology shock over every vessel, complete revascularization. In STEMI, open only culprit vessel. What we learn after 20 years in STEMI, open every vessel. In cardiology shock, should you open all the vessels? And this was the whole concept of complete lesion, culprit lesion, or complete uh, multi-vessel PCI. And it seems to be that culprit lesion only PCI is better. in terms of renal replacement or mortality at 30 days and the same data were there for one year so the key is the data which were there 30 days for also remained for one year so seems to be that in cardiac shock you do only culprit so that has been uh, the guidelines have updated already that culprit uh, the complete revascularization is uh, class 3 at present 
Then the issue comes, ISA React 5 trial was comparing Prasadol versus Ticagrelor in patients with acute coronary syndrome. We are two trials earlier, right? Triton 38 using Prasadol against Clopidogrel with our earlier stent strategy. Those are the cipher and so and actor. Then Plato was in the same similar era and comparing Ticagrelor with Clopidogrel and it basically showed in both of them that you do have better cardiovascular outcome with the Prasagul and Ticagrelor, but you have higher bleeding rate. So this is what the, we knew. But even in the acute coronary syndrome, the recommendations and focus completely became using these agents. So there is a one trial was done called PRAS-18. The patients uh, with MI, they randomized 1,200 patients to Prasagul or Ticagrelor, and they basically found no difference in outcome. So we do have a small trial before to show the Prasagul and Ticagrelor in STEMI patients was no different. So with that background, what about an acute coronary syndrome of various types? Comparing these two agents from our German investigators of the ISAR group, they made ISAR REACT 5, and basically was the patients, 4,000 patients, 12% were unstable angina, non stemi was 46%, uh, and uh, STEMI was about 40%. So qu question was whether one agent better than other, and you see that majority got uh, and geography, and there was a whole question was when you give Prasagrol, because the recommendation is you give it only on the table, Ticagrelor can be given before, and majority of these patients have uh, PCI as shown here. So what did we find? To the surprise of many people, but I can tell you personally, not me, uh, because I was always been a very big proponent of Prasagrol in uh, uh, our cat lab, uh, that basically showed that event rate was lower with Prasagrol, primary event rate, Death, MI, stroke, and definite stent thrombosis, while there was bleeding, no difference. So as far as the stronger agents, bleeding was no different, but other endpoints, clinical endpoints were lower with the Prasagul compared to Ticagrelor. And these are the points here, point estimates, so almost a 3% difference and no difference in the bleeding and so on. So this is one field. So basically showing that Prasagul was better the way it was tested, always remains that maybe it's not individual experience, but you have to just go to the trial design and the way trial was done, that it was beneficial uh, and so. Then question was, uh, in old patients, uh, you know the Plato showed that Ticagrelor is better, but there was no age limit and they never specified uh, in that group. So what about the 70 years and above acute coronary syndrome patients? Do they need clopidogrel or Ticagrelor? We particularly do they need Ticagrelor? That's the question in these patients after loading dose. And so, so what they found in the popular ACE trial uh, published in Lancet that this is the Ticagrelor or Prasagrel, which uh, Prasagrel was a very small group, and Clopidogrel significantly lower bleeding and no difference in death amine stroke. So, wow. <laughs> we just did the 10 years ago, Plato, Triton, all the trials, and uh, Ticagrelor was zero. What happened? Well, very simple. Our stent designs are different. Our techniques have become different. And clearly that to me, because the win here is the technical advancement of interventional cardiology. So other things have become like neutral. So your strengths are so good, your techniques are so good and so on. Then we go to our main trial of uh, Mount Sinai, which was started uh, right here, uh, conducted by Roxana Mehran, Twilight trial of aspirin discontinuation, which we know that uh, in the past the trials have done, we have stopped the P2 vitral inhibitor uh, before, and the whole question comes, that should you be stopping aspirin? And what about, we are giving, uh, particularly with the stronger anti therapy, can you skip aspirin? So this concept actually started many years ago. First trial was the global leaders trial, where experimental group versus the control group, where the aspirin was stopped after one month, and basically showed non statistic better of the experimental group is stopping aspirin, but didn't make it to a, a positive uh, outcome. And then within there, after adjudication, seems to be that clearly, which we call glassy study, which is a subgroup analysis, which is adjudicated uh, patient uh, outcomes uh, published in JAX, showed that yes, experimental group is stopping aspirin uh, at uh, one month, in patient between Ticagrelor was better compared to your control group. So then, this whole issue of removing aspirin, they did many trials. One was a short, a smart choice trial, 
and basically various types of cents. 77% got propertical, 23% got brassagrel or ticagrelor, and stopped the aspirin at three months. And what did they find? As you can see here, that you have a primary endpoint MACI, no difference by stopping aspirin. Then another trial is stopped that too. Is stopping aspirin at one month, not three months, one month just like global leader, and found again, one month that because aspirin out, overall outcome remains better in favor of stopping aspirin because lower bleeding, no difference in acute ischemic endpoints. So again, I just mentioned that whether you give this antiplatelet therapy, that antiplatelet therapy didn't matter because the way our stent techniques have really improved. So then led to the major trial of ticagrelor with or without aspirin high risk patients after PCI. And the whole question was that after three months, can you drop aspirin? And that was the superior the superiority trial in terms of lower bleeding and without having a decrease change in ischemic endpoints. So this is a very intense trial of 9,000 plus patients. After three months, patients didn't have an event. About 7,100 plus were randomized to continue ticagrelor plus aspirin or ticagrelor placebo. Everything was done in a double-blinded fashion. And then after the stoppage, the whole question was, once you stop it, after 12 months, what will happen? Would you have a more higher event rate? So basically, this is one-to-one -one randomization, as you can see here, and basically from bleeding point of view, no question, superiority of that ticagrelor monotherapy, as shown here. So then, second question, these are the pre-specified individual bleeding endpoints, all favors ticagrelor blue bar, which is lower than the red bar, where aspirin was continued. And then, biggest question was, what about the, your ischemic endpoint? By aspirin, we are worried about in this high-risk patient. Well, very reassuring. No difference in the ischemic endpoint as shown here. And these are the individual endpoints. Even in patients with the acute coronary syndrome, as you can see here, stable syndrome to the unity, in ACS more benefit. Significant benefit compared to stable syndrome, complex, and since then, multiple papers have come out from the twilight answering various of these individual points, the diabetic, complex cases, stable patients, uh, CKD patients, and so on and so forth, as showing the ticagrelor better. Towards that, there's another trial called Tycho trial. Ticagrelor with or without aspirin, acute coronary syndrome. And this is, uh, uh, clearly you see the patients with the acute coronary syndrome, they have, have both uh, MI, uh, STEMIs, and the non STEMI, uh, and uh, three months of DAS, also similar benefits. So, seems to be that removing aspirin in the phase background of ticagrelor is completely safe and was lower bleeding. So, we have many trials now to answer. With that note, uh, the main trial, I would say, of last uh, one and a half year has been the ischemia trial of invasive versus conservative strategy. Remember the original trial in 2006-07, courage, patient with stable CAD, PCI, or medical therapy. No difference, but the biggest flaw of that trial was patient had an angiogram, then you decided to randomize. So many of the high-risk patients were not randomized. Because proximal LED, proximal circumflex, you have 90% lead and you say, oh, I'm not putting this patient on medical therapy. What if you can take these patients back to the office and randomize before they come to the cath lab? And that was basically a was uh, because also we learned that in the trial, courage trial, that nuclear study study, uh, that uh, ischemia reduction improves outcome and PCI do a better job of ischemia reduction. With that, and there are a few of the... Uh, meta-analysis of the trials have shown. So ischemia trial basically was the concept that all patients did have CCTA to rule out no disease or less main disease, but then randomized to invasive strategy, optimal medical therapy and cath and revascularization or conservative strategy, optimal medical therapy and cath reserved for or optimal medical therapy failure only. So these were not the refractory patients, these were not the stable patients. Also. All of them required that they have a moderate to severe ischemia. This is why the name was ischemia, by the non-invasive testing. These are the individual criteria. It has been shown multiple times. So I just want to show mine uh, part of it, that yes, many of these patients were ischemic, uh, very good in terms of uh, medical therapy, which were done in terms of uh, statins and other uh, adjunct drugs. And basically what they found is very interesting, that as you can see here, the invasive group, majority of them got to the cash lab. And even in the conservative group, about 28% went to the cath lab. And, of course, about 80% got the invasive revascularization, 
And in the, this 28, 31% cases, about 23% in the conservative group also had a revascularization. So what we learned basically is that uh, revascularization 80% in the invasive group of the 20% with no revascularization because many of them have very uh, insignificant disease or extensive disease which could not be revascularized and uh, PCI was done in 74 and CABIT was done in 26% of cases. With that note, what did we find? That after initial uh, difference, invasive strategy had a 13.3% five-year outcome versus 15.5, and these outcomes were death, MI, hospitalization, heart failure, resuscitated cardiac arrest. So key p-value was non-significant. The difference was 2.2%, non-significant uh, in favor of invasive, but did not make a p-value difference. Now, if you take death or MI, similar story. Again, no significant difference, but same about 2.2%. So whether you take the all endpoints, or that am I 2.2% favor of a invasive strategy compared to medical. But what we learned is a little different story for the MI. So MI, if you follow here, so, so the invasive of the red. In the beginning, higher MI. But after one year of follow-up, you start seeing the curve separating that lower MI with the invasive group compared to conservative uh, strategy. So this basically was the patient's if you take them, uh, the MI, procedure MI, higher with the invasive group, but the spontaneous MI was higher with the conservative group with a p-value significant in both the groups. So question comes that after you're done with the PCI, why these patients continue to have MI? Overall endpoints are not different. It just tells you that even you do medical therapy, these patients, you know, you left untreated in many of them, and they continue to present uh, with the MI. So conclusion basically was the last trial of showing no overall benefit of one strategy versus the other. But yes, invasive strategy reduced the incidence of spontaneous MI compared to conservative strategy, which none of the trials in the past has shown. First time, ischemia trials showed that. Uh, and then there was quality of life uh, parameters also. We see angina class, this patient, conservative strategy versus the, the uh, invasive strategy in the red. So anything on the right uh, basically go away, means 100. Uh, when you have no angina, it's 100. Your severe angina is zero. So more curves go on to this side, it's better with the invasive strategy compared to conservative. So angina class did improve, uh, particularly with those who have weekly or monthly angina. So of course, there was a lot of criticism about the trial that stand fail, revascularization doesn't work, but we need to understand the type of cases which were done, these were not a refractory patient, and then of course the decision was made after many of all of them, or almost 80 plus percent, had a CTA rule out the left main disease. So clear question comes that how do we take this into account? It, it is that you need to have personally, I would say, discussion with the patients that yes, in the past we used to jump up and down somebody who had ischemia. So what we learned from the ischemia that you can wait, you don't have to push it further, uh, and uh, these patients will do. Uh, uh, well on the long run show. So this, with that, I sum it up and uh, get into my last minute of presentation, which I put it together, what I have said so far, that if I put the trials, radial PCI in STEMI, dicagular in diabetic, genotyping uh, is plus minus, so maybe negative, uh, FFR guided PCI, clopidogrel 70 plus, invasive strategy in ischemic heart disease, stable ischemic heart disease gets not up, conservative strategy, actually even much better, PCI for left main, multi-vessel multi STEMI or complete revascularization PCI, and NOAC alone without aspirin in AFib and PCI is good. And then lastly, the Prasagulin acute coronary syndrome or aspirin, one to three months post PCI plus ticagrelor is the way to go, change our overall uh, intervention, our approach uh, to become better interventionist and make a improved survival. With that note, I stop here. Thank you very much. I can take the questions now. We got few minutes. Yeah. Dr. Sharma, do you think that the given the trend we're seeing and going more towards a single end of the backbone with like Pythagoras as a model therapy, do you foresee that the time frame in which we use dual end of the therapy is going to get shorter and shorter, especially for elective PCI? Yeah. So actually, there is another trial which is going uh, of uh, the pressure group, no experts. Right, even time zero. So there are escort, you know, there are a few trials ongoing at present. So key is what it looks like now that aspirin is used 
is required for a minimum period of time. So whether it could be one day or one month, definitely you don't need three months for sure now. So between one day and one month. Now, how will they incorporate in the guideline, we need to see. But yes, it seems to me that once you have used, you are using particularly these stronger agents. We have some data with the clopidogrel also, but definitely with the presidol and ticagrelor, in my opinion, aspirin has no added benefit at present. And so also, anticoagulants, you know, and no S. In the past, we used to worry about that no S, maybe we need to give antiplatelet therapy. We are learning, no, you don't need. Because by giving your antiplatelet therapy, you are even creating more problem, and particularly aspirin for a shot, which adds to their increased bleeding. You have, you have used Prasurel for many years, even before the yeah. drug. Would you start using Prasurel monotherapy ahead, based yeah. on uh, the evidence on, uh, from Twilight? Yeah, so that question comes is that uh, the data of the Twilight is for the Ticagrelor. We still have to have a little more, a little data, actually, about a small, uh, as I mentioned, the pilot study, I think the escort, uh, the pilot study of a uh, small group. Uh, the Ken Prasurel also will be a test of, you know, test towards it. The, I would say that whether my personal recommendation that where we have to stop aspirin for some reason because patient has GI bleed, patient with a liver cirrhosis and so, we are done so many times on single antiplatelet therapy, which we have been doing. So key is that, yeah, if there's any question about the bleeding issue, just skip the aspirin as early as possible without any harm. There's no question in my mind now. And now we have the data of one month, so for the stop DAP and uh, you name it, uh, you know, one to three months, and now with a single alone agent, it will actually will become, the strategy will become simpler. And uh, as long as there is no difference in ischemic endpoint and uh, cause uh, lower bleeding, that's what you want. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yes.